All right, everyone. So today we're going to be talking about functions, symbols, and namespaces. This video is sort of a little precursor to learning about macros. So if you want to learn about list macros and really get to some of the interesting parts about list programming, this video is a good place to start. All right, so we've already seen a little bit about functions and closure, um, but I'm just going to start with a quick example. So a function generally is something that accepts an input and returns an output. Remember that in Clojure, the final statement of a function is also its return value. So if I define this function and then I evaluate it, I get the return value, which is the last statement in the function, x plus 10. Now what's really neat here is if I have a function in Clojure, I can treat it like any other object in the language. So if I have this function, add 10, I can assign it to a variable. And then if I evaluate x of 14, I'll get the same answer of 24. So basically, the value of x is now this function add 10. And if I call x, it's like the same as calling add 10. So x of 14 is 24. x of 21 is 31, etc. And calling x works exactly the same way as calling add 10. Now, what's really neat is with functions in Clojure, you can treat them just like you would any other object or data structure. So you can do things like use them as part of a list. You can use them as values in a hash map. So something like this. And so basically all the stuff that you could do with just like an arbitrary object, you can also do with a function. What's really neat here is once I have a data structure like this, I can use it and it works exactly the way you would expect. So if I go ahead and I set Y to be equal to the value of this hash map, then I can look up a key in Y get this function as a result, and then apply it to some inputs, and it works exactly the way that you would expect. And so this evaluates to add 10. And so this statement is add 10 of 15. So that's why this is 25. <laughs> now we've seen how you can use a function to assign it to a variable or to use it in a data structure. But since it works like just a normal object, you can also use a function as an input to another function. So if I have a function, apply to 15. This function takes a function func as input and returns the result of applying func to 15. So if I take apply to 15 of add 10, I get the result of 25. Now, if I call this with a different function, I'm just going to paste it here so it's easier to follow, then I would get a different result. And so what this statement is doing is it's evaluating this statement, which in turn is evaluating add 20 of 15. So evaluating this is just like evaluating this. And so what's key to remember here is that apply to 15 is a function that takes another function as input. All right, so now let's try another example. Um, so let's see another function apply twice that takes a function and an argument, and then it returns function of function of the argument. So it basically takes a function and an argument, and then it applies that function to the argument over and over uh, two times. Uh, so if I take apply twice, and then I pass it in um, add 20 and five as input, then you'll see that I get 45 as the result because what this is really evaluating is add 20 of add 20 of 5. And similarly, if I called apply twice of add 10 of 5, I would get 25 because it's doing add 10 
add 10 of 5. All right, so now that we've gotten some of the definitions out of the way, let's see if we can sit down and actually do something useful. So let's say I have a list of numbers. Let's say 1, 2, 3, uh, 7, and 9. And what I want is I want to take each of these numbers and then add 10 to it. So let's say the result that I want is 11, 12, 13, 17, 19. In the old days, uh, if I was using an imperative language, I might have something like int r equals new int 5, then, oops, um, then for i for int i equals 0, i is less than 5, i plus plus, I would have r of i equals add 10 of i, and then I would return the result. Let me make this a little bigger. And so what this would do is this would create a new array and fill the result with adding 10 to each of its elements. Now let's say we wanted to go ahead and we wanted to do the exact same thing, but this time we wanted to add 20 to each of the elements. So we wanted as output like 21, 22, et cetera, all the way up to the end of the list. So we could implement this in Java uh, using another for loop. So we could do something like int r equals new int 5, and then basically type out the whole thing again. But this time, instead of saying r of i equals add 10 of i, we would say r of i equals add 20 of i. Now, if you're paying attention here, you'll notice that these two blocks of code are almost exactly the same. Like they're basically doing the exact same thing. The only thing that's different. <laughs> oh, uh, I just realized I'm a dumbass. Uh, hold on. The only difference is which function I apply to each of the inputs. So in the first block, I'm applying add 10 to every input. And in the second one, I'm applying add 20. And so you'll notice there's a lot of repeated code here. And it'd be really nice if we could abstract out the common bits of code and just pass in the function that we want to apply, add 10 or add 20, as input to the operation that we want to do. So in closure, this function is called map. And what this does is it takes a function and a list and it applies that function to every element of the list and returns the result. So this snippet of code here is doing the same thing as, as this whole block of code right here. And similarly, I could take map add 20 to every element in the input and I would get the result. Another really common thing that you'd wanna do is you want to take the elements of a list and then do some operation to combine all of the elements together. Um, so for example, if you had a list one, two, three, four, five, and you wanted to get the sum of all the elements in the list. So going back to our imperative example, uh, if you wanted to do something like this in the old days, you might do something like int uh, current sum equals zero and then for every element in the list, you'd want to set the current sum to be equal to the addition of the current sum and input of i. Now I'm writing it this way instead of something like cursum plus equals input i, just to make it more clear how we're using functions. All right, and then I would return the result. I'm actually gonna go through the list in reverse order just to make some of the analogies easier to understand. And so what this is doing is it's taking add of the initial value and the last element of the list, 
And then it's taking the result of this calculation and then plugging it in to the result of this calculation with the next element in the list. And then it does that again. And then it does that again. And it keeps doing that until it gets through all the elements of the list. <laughs> and so over and over again, it's applying add to the new element and the last output. We could also do the same thing with multiplication. So if I wanted to calculate, uh, let's say five factorial, then I could do something like this and I would get the right result. So closure has a function for this. It's called reduce and it takes a function and a list. And it applies that function recursively to each of the elements in the list. So it's essentially doing the same thing as this right here. And it would also work the same way if I wanted to multiply. So I could do reduce times of the list one, two, three, four, five, and it would get me five factorial. <laughs> All right, so now let's go ahead and let's do something a little bit practical. Let's say I have two vectors, uh, three, four, nine, 12, and eight, seven, and I wanna calculate the distance between them. Uh, this is the L2 metric for all of you math nerds out there. Uh, what I can do is I can use map to subtract these two lists. So I'm gonna do map of minus, actually I'm gonna give these lists a name first, so def L1 and def L2. And then I'm going to map minus of L1 and L2. Right, and I can see the result is the subtraction of the elements of these lists. All right, and then I want to square them. So I'm going to map uh, function x uh, math pow x2 of this list. And then I want to get the sum. So I'm going to reduce with plus. And then I want to get the square root of this whole expression. All right, and that's how we can kind of quickly uh, use map and reduce together to calculate the distance between two vectors. Now, what's really cool here is even though we use plus and times in our example, uh, this function right here can really be any function of two arguments. And so for whatever function this is, it repeatedly does func of the current value and the next element in the list, just like we've done right here. We can also give our reduction a starting value. So this would be analogous to initializing cursum equals zero in our Java example. Um, so for example, we could do uh, reduce plus and then initialize it with a value of 20 and then give it the same list. And you can see the result is 35, which is 20 more than 15. Now, putting these ideas together, we can use reduce to do some pretty interesting things. Uh, for example, like initializing a hash map. So for example, I could do something like reduce a function of cur map new element. And then I could associate cur map of new element with let's say a uh, new element times four. And then I need to initialize it with an empty map. And then I could apply it to this list. 
and I would get a map of each element of the list to that element times four. And so by just putting kind of interesting functions in here, I can make reduce and map do really interesting things, uh, especially when you combine the two together. So in the same way that we can write down 10 as just the number 10, or we can write down ASDF as just the string ASDF, we can also write down the function that takes its input and adds 10 to it without ever assigning a name to this function. So this right here is just a value or an object representing a function. And so we call these anonymous functions because it's a function without a name to it. Now, when I have this value representing a function, I can use it just like I would any other function. So for example, I can apply the function to some input and look at the result. So this applies this function to the input 15, and it's actually doing the same thing as calling add 10 of uh, 15. And we can use this just like we would any other type of value. So for example, I could do something like set a variable to be equal to this function. And then I could use this variable and it would work in exactly the way you would expect. So this statement here is essentially doing the same thing as this statement here, right? These are just sort of two different ways of defining the same function. All right, so let's sit down here and let's take a closer look at what this uh, def statement is actually doing. So when I write this statement, def add 10 is equal to this function, what I'm really saying is we're assigning the symbol add 10 to contain the value, this function value. So now after I execute this, this symbol add 10 is a little box containing this value. And if I go and I evaluate add 10, I get this function as a result. Now, Clojure is really different from a lot of other languages in that it lets you talk about the symbol add 10 directly. And it lets you access the symbol itself in your code rather than only being able to access the symbol's value. So instead of writing add 10 here, I could write single quote add 10. And instead of returning the value of the function, it just returns the symbol add 10. And then if I go ahead and I evaluate this symbol, then I get the function as a result. And this works the same way if I were to define any other type of variable. So for example, if I could define def z2 to be 20, and then I evaluate z2, I would get the value of 20. But then I could also access just the symbol, so just the symbol in the language representing sort of the name z2. And then if I evaluate this symbol, I can see that it points to the value of 20. So basically, z2 is a symbol that points to the value of 20. Now, something that's really neat about symbols that you're probably already sort of intuitively familiar with is that they mean different things based on the different contexts in which they're evaluated. So for example, if I write a function, let's say def n uh, add 10 of n, and then I say plus 10 n, then inside of the body of this function, the symbol n has a value, right? Whatever you passed as input effectively in this area is the value of n. So if I said like add 10 of let's say 20, then when I call this function, the value of n here is set to 20. But outside of this function, the symbol n has no meaning. So if I just go ahead and I try to evaluate n just like by itself somewhere in the code, I'll get this error, uh, which basically says that there's no symbol n in this context, right? Because it doesn't mean anything outside of the function. So we say that inside of the function, n is bound to a value, but outside of the function evaluation, n is unbound. Now, if I just want to make a symbol that I can use locally, so I just want to like a little local variable, I can use this syntax let, uh, so let n is five, and then inside of this context, the symbol n will be bound to a value of five. So if I now do plus n and 20, I'll see the result where inside of this block n is equal to five. Now, once again, n is only bound inside of the context of this let statement. So if I were to go ahead and try to evaluate n again, I would get the same error. All right, so now at this point, you might be thinking, if I go ahead and I try to define n multiple times, which value is the symbol bound to? So if I go ahead and I try to do something like let n be 20, 
And then after that, I let n be five. And then I go ahead and evaluate this. I'll get a result of 25. So basically, whenever there's multiple kind of competing definitions to try to bind the value of the symbol, uh, it always just uses the most recent one. Uh, so this is called lexical binding. I won't go through like the full, full details of lexical binding, but basically like intuitive explanation, it just uses the most direct ancestor. Now it's really interesting, and this is something that you cannot do in a lot of other languages, is as we've already seen, instead of accessing the content of the variable, we can access the name for the variable itself. And so what's really neat here, and this is sort of a little preview of what we're gonna get to later, is you can talk about your code as a list of symbols, and then you can do operations on that list of symbols. Now in other languages, you might've seen uh, operations that allow you to evaluate a string. Uh, so for example, you might be able to do eval uh, plus three, four, and you can do this type of thing in a lot of languages. Uh, like you can do this in JavaScript, like basically most languages with an interpreter uh, allow you to do something like this. But what's really neat and what makes Lisp different from a language like JavaScript is that a string is just a string of data and it doesn't have any semantic meaning. So when you type out the string, you don't know any extra information like three means something in the language and plus means something in the language and four means something in the language. You don't know automatically that these are all separate things uh, that all have their own individual and separate meanings. But in Clojure, uh, when you work with symbols and you go and you evaluate something like this, each of these symbols means something in the language. And so instead of just having a string of data or just some bytes that you know about, Already we can see that just from using these symbols, Lisp code has some structure and the use of symbols provides us access directly to that structure. All right, so last up, I just wanna quickly talk about namespaces and namespace resolution. So let's say I go to define a new variable. So let's say I do like def x is 20 and I go and I execute this. I can see that it returns a variable, so it like, returns the thing that I just defined, uh, but it doesn't return the symbol X. It actually returns this weird thing that's hashtag quote and then test projects dot function slash X. Uh, so what's going on here is that uh, test project dot functions is the namespace that we are currently in. So when we define the variable x, we actually are defining uh, something that is prefixed by the namespace. So when we define the variable x, the thing that we're actually defining is testproject.function slash x. And this is just something to make sure that the names that you have in different files don't like clash with each other. And so the namespace itself is this thing that you define at the top of the file. Um, so this says what the namespace for this file currently is. So this file has a namespace of testproject.functions, uh, which is exactly what we saw down here. Now, when Clojure goes to evaluate a symbol, so when Clojure actually evaluates a symbol, um, what it does is it first looks up, what does that symbol mean in the current namespace? So if I type the symbol X and I go to evaluate this, it actually first does this step called resolve, which looks up what the symbol means in the current namespace. So in the context of the namespace that I'm currently in, the symbol X resolves to this variable, testprojects.function slash X. And you can see that the variable is different than just a symbol because it has this little hashtag in front of it. Then during evaluation, Clojure gets the value inside of this variable and that's what it uses as part of program evaluation. So really what's happening is Clojure reads your code, parses it into symbols, resolves those symbols, and then gets the value inside of those resolved symbols. Now, if I just have a symbol X and I really wanna specify explicitly that this is not just any X, but I'm referring to the specific symbol in the current namespace, I can use this little backtick instead of a single quote 
and it'll create a symbol with the namespace attached. Note that this is still a symbol. It's just a symbol with some extra information on it so that if I were to use the symbol in another context, the resolution step would still know where to look. Anyway, if you've made it this far in the video, you're a real trooper. Thanks so much for watching. As always, give the video a like, subscribe to the channel. I'm really excited to talk about macros in the next part of this series, and I'll see you in the next one.